Everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon to those who are joining us online. Uh, welcome to what is, I think, the first ever webinar done from the Oslo Government Centre. Um, others may be able to correct me on that, but uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you. Uh, because we uh, have people joining us online, I don't think we'll do a round of in the, uh, introductions here. Um, but we have a number of people online and about 10, 12 in the room, so that's very good to see. Um, this is the first, I hope, of several webinars, many webinars that we will help hold. I'm very pleased to welcome our presenter, Benjamin Cook, to join us this afternoon. I'll introduce him in a minute. Um, but first, just a few sort of house rules comments as we are streaming. Um, because we're streaming, if you could hold any questions you have until the end of the presentation, that would be good. And there will be a lot of opportunity for discussion and, and so on. Uh, as we go along uh, afterwards, because we have quite a lot of time. If you are online and you have a question or comment, please type it into the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. To bring out the chat box, you need to click on the icon of your hangout screen. I hope that makes more sense to those of you who are online than it does to me. Uh, the other thing, please, if, if you are online, is to kindly keep your microphone muted during the course of the webinar. Uh, and just also to note that not only are we online now, we will be recording it and making it available on our YouTube channel for the wider practitioner community. So I hope that's okay to everybody. for everybody. If it's not, please tell us afterwards. Um, and you are also encouraged to live tweet or retweet the highlights using the hashtag UNDPOGC. And our Twitter handle is at UNDPOGC. So, without much further ado, I will uh, introduce our presenter today, who is Benjamin Kumpf. He's a policy specialist in the Innovation Group. You can correct me if I get this wrong. Uh, the developer, policy specialist on innovation in the Development Impact Group. That's correct. Within UNDP's Bureau for Policy and Program Support. Benjamin joined UNDP in 2009 and explores topics such as behavioral insights, human-centered design, big data, and other practical ways to respond to complexity in development. Uh, I have a long CV of him here, which I won't go into, as I'm sure we all want to get on with the, um, with the seminar today. And so um, he can introduce himself a bit further to us if he wants. Uh, I've warned him that I intend to be a, a cynical chair, because I think we all agree that there's a lot of discussion about innovation in governance, and I think there are also quite a lot of questions about innovation in governance and its importance or not within the development agenda. So uh, I'm looking forward to a robust and rigorous and um, engaged discussion this afternoon. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Thanks for being here this afternoon. Thanks for the introduction. There's not much more to say. For UNDP since 2009, prior to that, I worked for the German Bilateral Corporation in Rwanda, India, and Nepal. And I come from social activism. So I come with a critical view on an organization like UNDP, our organization, but not a cynical one. Very happy to try to incorporate new ways of doing business. I have a PowerPoint presentation, and we'll talk in the beginning a little bit about how we go about driving innovation in UNDP, and then give some examples from the field of governance. About 80% of the initiatives we support with our innovation fund are in the area of governance. That's what I'm going to focus on today. We have other examples as well, which I'm happy to talk about after the presentation. And yeah, as Sarah said, please then just note your questions down, and we'll have a discussion after going through the slide deck. If I'm not talking loudly enough for the people online, just leave a comment and address it, please. All right, so innovation, quite the buzzword at the moment. To start off, just a teaser. After this presentation, I hope you have an idea what you can do with very limited amount of funding. Can you go on one slide, please? To encourage citizens in your country. No, oh, just one. To pay their taxes on time. Small scale innovation, when I say small scale, I mean very little investment, a couple of ten thousand of dollars and pounds respectively, led to an increase in tax revenue in the UK by about 20 million pounds 
in recent years. How that's done, I'm going to explain later because we actually partnered with the people behind this to address development challenges in different countries. Corruption, a big impediment for development without a doubt. In the course of that presentation, I'll tell you a little bit about how a small scale investment of just $40,000 in Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinea being one of the most affected countries of corruption. It's currently number 44 out of 175 on Transparency International Corruption Index. Led to, within four months, an initiative that resulted in 250 cases being under investigation of corruption just at the staff of the Ministry of Finance being the pilot group to report corruption, with technology as an enabler, but not a tech driven. So those are just two teasers for what's to come. And I'm not going to go into the theory of innovation. We realize that talking about innovation theory is quite boring. Talking about how innovation made a difference in people's lives is quite exciting. So not much theory today. But just to preempt for us, innovation is not the same as technology. It's not about developing an app or a fancy website. Innovation is not the same as just good ideas. In fact, the discourse we drive in UNDP is that innovation needs to be adding a value to the end user. And innovation is about testing hypotheses. You have an idea how a different way of doing business could add value, could be more effective, and you test it, and you find out if that's really the case. It's not the same as tech, it's not the same as invention and just coming up with ideas. So this working definition that's here on the slide that you can see is just the invitation to broadly frame innovation. On undp.org slash innovation, that's our website, you find nine principles for innovation and development. About a year and a half ago, we developed those principles together with UNICEF, with the World Bank, and seven other partners to frame innovation. We don't have the last ultimate definition of it, but framing it with principles such as design with the end user, design for scale, but also do no harm, are for us an important element to communicate what do we mean with innovation? But in the end, it's about to make an impact for the end user. That's what we're measuring ourselves against. So in UNDP, we drive innovation through a global team, which we institutionalized last year with a structural reform within UNDP. We have innovation experts sitting in our regional hub, one person per regional hub. There are five regional hubs of UNDP in the world, and a small team in New York of essentially four people. We drive innovation through initiatives that we support throughout the world. Last year, we established the innovation facility, which is not a physical facility. It's a global project. It's our team. It's an innovation board of five senior managers in UNDP, and that's important. I'll talk a bit more about why that's important later on. But those people give us strategic guidance and more importantly, they give us waivers to break the rules here and there. And we have within this project a fund with contributions from Denmark and UDP's own contributions. And through that decentralized fund, we support initiatives in different countries where colleagues test out new ways of doing business to see do they add value to the development challenges they're addressing. And out of these initiatives, those 85 that we supported in 2014 and supporting this year, about 80% on the area of governance. But we work across all thematic areas of UNDP. We drive innovation through a network of practitioners and partners. We have a global network. And again, when you go to uniporg slash innovation, there is a link to our community site. We have a network of about 600 members and external partners are very welcome to join. You'll receive a monthly newsletter with updates on our work. But we also have closed regional networks of those colleagues who drive innovation to keep each other informed, to spread ideas across countries, more importantly, to help each other out when we have questions. Now, 
I'll go into a couple of examples of what we did over the past not only two years, but the last four years. We have been looking in UNDP at innovation more strategically. We brought in about 10 to 12 new ways of doing business. We pursued two objectives. One is we look outside. What are interesting ways of doing business coming from the private sector and the public sector? We bring them in. We test them in concrete development programs and projects and see do they add value. The other objective is, based on this work, we provide innovation services to governments. And this is a service line being increasingly requested by governments. We just shaped, together with South Korea, a proposal on this for Asia Pacific. But we are already working with a number of governments in Eastern Europe on institutionalizing innovation labs within their public sector. What does it mean an innovation lab is actually the first example. This is an image from Egypt. Last year, we ran three innovation camps, so impromptu labs, in Egypt. The development challenge is sexual violence, sexual harassment, a rampant problem in Egypt, and a significant number of women and girls are not reporting incidences of sexual violence and sexual harassment. Why? We do have some data sets on it, but what we did, and this is one of the big methods that we bring in. The method is called human-centered design. You might have heard it from software development, and it's increasingly important in the public sector to redesign public services. The idea is to start with empathy in which the user, the perspective of the user. We brought in, in Cairo, but also in two smaller Egyptian towns, young women and a few young men who are affected by the development challenge. And we wanted to hear, what is the problem based from your perspective? Why don't you report? Why don't your friends report? Why don't your peers report? And based on those insights, those points of pain, the next two days were dedicated to coming up with ideas, concrete solutions. What can we do to address those impediments of reporting? And already, in some instances, physically prototyping those ideas. What we usually do in innovation labs, innovation camps, is we come up with a lot of ideas, and then we boil it down to a few winners that we execute and test. In those cases, we had Vodafone as a private sector partner who did not only provide seed funding to the top three ideas to test them in a six-month period, but also to provide technical guidance to the winning teams because they were mobile enabled, two out of the three. That's a new way of doing business for UNDP. It's co-designing solutions with the people affected, bringing in not only the people affected as designers, we don't consult them, we design with them, but also policy makers, decision makers. We ran similar exercises for different development challenges. One was public transportation was not conducive for people with disabilities. We brought staff from a design college, policy makers, and people with disabilities together we let the policymakers experience how is it to roam around town in public transportation in a wheelchair. Based on those experiences, we had a two-day ideation event similar to this methodology. And the result was a physical redesign of the buses, the signposts being lower, and an app for people with disabilities, especially with um, seeing disabilities, to find out when the transportation system arrives. We provide seed funding and we come up in a new way with development solutions. We don't start with a solution being created just by UNDP and government people, but co-designed with the people affected. And also dig deeper into what is the problem at hand. And that's just an image from one of our main partners, MindLab in Denmark. MindLab opened its doors nine years ago, one of the first innovation labs in the public sector to embrace this method of human-centered design to redesign public services. The private sector does it quite often. Virgin Airlines, instead of just looking how does the customer experience going on a plane, they look, my client, what does his journey look like from the moment he leaves the door to get on our plane, and how can we improve the points of contact with us? And you can do the same for public services. <coughs> Somebody receiving advice on employment, for example, and finding a new employment. And identifying those points of pain from the perspective of the end user and addressing it, redesigning of the end user, 
is one of the cornerstones of innovation labs that we are setting up with government partners, but that we also set up within UNDP in different parts of the world with different focuses. We address youth unemployment in Armenia with UNICEF, also youth unemployment in Haiti, and we address governance um, elements in, for example, Moldova and Georgia. Based on this method of co-designing with the user, we often develop mobile feedback mechanisms. You know that cell phone penetration is very high even in least developed countries. We are seeing a rise in smartphone penetration in a number of middle and income countries. And again, for us, innovation is not about developing apps. It's using the technology that makes sense in the national context to pursue development challenges and address them in the best way possible. The example I mentioned at the beginning from Papua New Guinea resulted not only in available data, how rampant the problem of corruption is in Papua New Guinea, but also the openness of the government, which is a condition to develop feedback mechanisms and citizen engagement mechanism to address this problem. So with partners from the Ministry of Finance, we developed the idea of a simple reporting system not an app, but an SMS system. We addressed the issues of security, and we ran with it for four months to see is there traction. And within four months, in a test group of just 1,200 people, we received considerable traction. Two people were arrested, and they're suspected the cases of corruption are in the realm of two million. We had a number of cases reported. We have new development partners on board, Australian Aid, we have partners from the private sector who think this is the right initiative to address corruption in addition to others. Um, and widespread awareness campaigns in newspapers in Papua New Guinea. And now we are investing in the second round. Last year, with our innovation fund, we supported 45 initiatives. And we just looked back and we saw that out of those 45, we saw an uptake in 50% of the cases. An uptake meaning the government investing in such an initiative, the private sector taking on such an approach, or also UNDP. Design for scale is one of our principles, and we always ask our colleagues when they come forward with ideas, who wants your idea? What's your scaling pathway? How can this be handed over to the private sector? How can it be handed over to the public sector? And in Papua New Guinea, again, phase two, we'll roll it out to the whole population. The element of do no harm is very important as this is a sensitive issue and some of our colleagues received death threats already based on this initiative. But it also shows there's some traction. We might be on the right track. We might be hitting the right spots. This is another example. And when we talk innovation, for me it's important to underline we're not talking about new ideas necessarily. We're talking about smart ways of doing business that are effective. And this concept of stealing with pride is something we promote quite aggressively. Why not take an idea that worked somewhere else and adapt it to the context? We promote to be very context specific, not to replicate so-called bad practices. That is something we don't think works in complex environments. And usually the development challenges we work with are within complex environments. But adapting concepts that work, why not? In the UK, we had an initiative from citizens who were fed up with the potholes in their streets and developed a system called Fix My Street. They reported infrastructure damages. The government responded and reported back with a web page in real time. Where did they repair things? Quite a good mechanism for the interaction citizens and government. And we adapted this concept in the Maldives, started it last year, had a very good uptake by the government in terms of, oh yeah, we think this is the right way to interact with our citizens and a high response from citizens reporting infrastructure damages. So this is also going into round two from last year, taken up by the government. We call it Fix My Island. No, sorry, Make My Island. Fix My Street was from the UK. The next one. When we talk about innovation, again, it's not necessarily new. This practice of foresight has been around for some years. 
However, it's not strategically embraced neither by UNDP nor by most governments that we work with. And foresight is not about predicting the future. That is not possible in our opinion. However, the events of the so-called Arab Spring showed to many that political situations are quite volatile. This quote from Helen Clark, volatile is the new normal. And based on fast changing environments, it does make a lot of sense to kind of look, how can we make our planning more agile, more flexible to changes? Foresight brings together in its strategic foresight policymakers. This is an example of Rwanda last year. We have the expertise sitting in our UNDP Global Policy Center for Public Service Excellence in Singapore. Together with the Singapore Policy Center, we work with the government of Rwanda to bring in foresight in the national planning instruments. We conducted a number of exercises based on specific themes such as urbanization and looked at what are possible scenarios for the future of Rwanda, for the future of Kigali in terms of urbanization. And it's not about predicting, it's about coming up with different scenarios, assessing how plausible are they, are they possible, what is desirable, and then in your planning instruments to build in early warning mechanisms and also milestones of revisiting where are we, what future is about to pan out, and what should we change to get to the future that's more desirable, that's within our control. So instead of one situation analysis and we run with it for four years and then we see what changed, to constantly revisit and anticipate different scenarios. We saw an uptake of this way of planning by the government of Rwanda and Tonga last year in our based on our collaboration with the Singapore Policy Center. We also do participatory foresight, for example in Sudan. And there we bring in citizens, we bring in civil society to the degree possible activist group to open a space for civil society to talk about different futures, desirable futures, to broaden the scope of interactions with a government that in Sudan, of course, is very differently shaped than it would be in Norway in terms of civic liberties. So participatory foresight, strategic foresight are elements where we believe we can broaden the scope of smart planning and we become more agile together with our government partners. And we within UNDP embrace this instrument more and more as well, something we promote. Another way of addressing the complexity of development challenges is looking at how do humans actually make decisions? And are we actually all make decisions just as economists dream we do? Are we that rational beings that always take those smart decisions? And behavioral economics is not a new field. The Nobel Prize in 2002 went to somebody from that field. But applying it in development, according to us, makes a lot of sense, especially with research findings saying that when people live under stress, meaning in poverty, there's not enough cognitive resources left to always make decisions that would be the most beneficial to the well-being of the human. But independent if you live in poverty or not, it's an established finding that we don't always make the best decisions for ourselves. So what does it mean for development? I went into the tax letter example. The tax letter example was with the Behavioral Insights Unit, now called Team from the UK. Tony Blair institutionalized this small team when he started because he thought there are entry points for applying those insights for us, not only in addressing tax issues, but unemployment issues and others. We partnered with those experts to address a development challenge in Moldova. In this specific case, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Two people die due to the illness every day in Moldova, but it's a huge impediment for development because it usually hits people in their productive age between 18 and 45 and has does an impact on the economy. And we saw that many people were diagnosed with the hospital, start with the follow-up medical treatment, and then they discontinue. They fall sick, some of them die. Why do they discontinue, we ask ourselves, and we brought in experts. Oh, from behavioral insights to first observe 
and identify what are reasons for discontinuing. And then also to develop nudges. What can we do to remind people to take their medical treatment to avoid for them falling sick? And without going into the details of our finding on the reasons why they didn't take it, the nudges we designed were SMS alerts. And for those who are online, a weekly one minute Skype chat with a nurse where you take in front of a nurse on video your medication. And we are running a randomized control trial there. Randomized control trial meaning we divided the population who receives the nudges in, uh, in randomized groups and we have a control group that doesn't receive a nudge. And we will compare to what extent are our nudges successful. How many percent more people will follow through with their medical treatment to find out what works? Because it's not always evident. To make that point with what works and what doesn't, this is an example of Guatemala. In Guatemala, the government invited experts from Behavioral Insights to look at, can we rep replicate, can we adapt the example from the UK? Same thing, people were asked to pay their taxes. And those who were not asked with a letter, you just said um, 3.9 pay their taxes after the deadline. The government of Guatemala used to send out a regular letter and as a reaction to the regular letter, 4.3 people, 4.3 percent, sorry, paid their taxes. Now those economists went and tweaked it a little bit. The behavioral letter had, in opposite to the original letter, a call for action and a link to a website where you can actually pay. The standard letter just said, please pay your taxes, but didn't give a how. Then. The behavioral letter and the social norm included the call for action, but also 70% of your fellow citizens paid their taxes on time. We'd love you to join the others who paid their taxes. The other one had this, but also we deem your decision not to pay taxes as an active choice and you may face audit in the future. And the last one was, be a proud Guatemaltecan citizen, please pay your taxes. And it wasn't a given which one would work. It's just testing out different messages to see what works best. Here we see the results. And it was first done, um, all these different groups, together with 41,000 people. But the calculation was, if the behavioral and social norm that I would have sent right away to all 40,000, there would have been an additional income generation through taxes in the realm of several million. So small changes, but easy to monetize. And we believe that identifying what drives people behavior and then testing out different forms of either changing the choice architecture or different forms of nudges, if they're ethical, that's an important consideration, has a huge merit in development. So this already brings me to the end. I didn't want to talk too much. As a summary, it's important for us to not talk about the development of ideas, but really going to test, measure, and improve. Oh, that was too quick. As constantly revisiting our hypotheses, not only for our innovation initiatives, but for our work. This element of testing different nudges it can be done with policies. There's great work done in testing public policies in randomized control trials. That's a practice that UNDP is not yet embracing, but something we promote. It's, as all innovation, it's not a silver bullet. You always have to see, does it fit the context? Does it fit the theme? None of this is the so-called best practice. Some of this can be an added value and can be a more effective way of doing development. And this is a quote from Helen Clark that I like to put at the end because, again, it's not about a fancy app. It's not about a nice looking website. It's really about making a difference in people's lives where we measure our effectiveness of our innovation work against. And here's again the URL. You are very welcome to visit us on our website, join up for our network, to engage with us on Twitter. And that hashtag is used by us 
to talk about our work. When we promote innovation, and not only promote it, but also when we give seed funding to our country offices, we ask them not for much. While well, we ask them to be extremely data-driven, to have a scale pathway, and to do a good job. But in addition, we ask them to work out loud. We usually see that development programs and projects communicate quite a lot in the beginning. We are launching now a new program on FGM. And here are our partners. We will do ABC. And then usually once the execution implementation starts, it kind of dies down, and there's often radio silence. And then after two years, you have the evaluation report, and you have more communication. And we want to break of that pattern. And we ask our colleagues, you get seed funding from us. You have to work out loud once a month. We need to see a blog post from you, either on UNDP's blogs or on blogs that are relevant in your country in the national language that talk about the progress you're making that are ideally a call for partnering, and that are ideally also a call for critical feedback. We really promote to work not only in a transparent way, but also, I guess, in a modest way to constantly deliver it with partners, are we on the right track? What other inputs might be relevant? We think that innovation can only happen in partnerships, and that in actually most cases, the best expertise lies outside of the organization. So we try to mainstream those ways of doing business and offer our services to governments. Before I end, I'll just give you one practical example of what mainstreaming can mean. You might be familiar with the practice of open innovation challenges or challenge prizes. It's something the public sector does. We recently sat together with an innovation team of one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world we don't necessarily want to do business with, but we wanted to learn from the innovation team. How do they mainstream innovation? How do they change their culture? They, or also General Electrics, for example, they run open innovation challenges. They have a very specific technical challenge. They have the right, or they have good people in-house, but they think there might be smarter brains outside. Let's compete. And they invite people to come forward, and they say the best ideas will get a prize money award. And such open innovation challenges and innovation prices were absolutely against UDP's rules. So having senior management support, as I said earlier, is very important also for the reason we got a waiver. We had the development challenge of rural communities being off the grid in Bosnia. And together with Nesta, one of our partners that's a UK-based innovation fund, we ran an open innovation challenge and we asked providers of new uh, nuclear, of renewable energy, to come forward with solutions. We had 42 submissions of solutions for those of the grid communities in Bosnia, where the government did not invest in infrastructure to get them on the grid. A technical committee, committee looked at them, and then we tested the finalists and identified the winner that got the challenge prize money, and we had the best fit solution solar panels in that case um, that we introduced with the local community and got those communities on the grid. And based on this experience, we wrote a new policy making open innovation challenges permitted within UNDP. So changing the rules by first testing, sometimes breaking this rule or that, to see what works, and then constantly promoting through our newsletters, through our internal networks, and through our blogs what we perceive as an additional tool in our box that can add value. So that brings me to the end. I added two extra slides. One, ah, we'll just probably change the slide deck, uh, share the slide deck, is our regional innovation leads, um, a great team of colleagues who are all on Twitter. If you are on Twitter and you're interested in following news from development or innovation, I can recommend adding them. And then also, Lastly, we can maybe leave this up. Those are the nine innovation principles. But more interesting than the headlines are actually the few explanatory phrases on our website that you see under those headlines. So with innovation, we constantly scan the horizon what's out there. We brought in new ways of doing business. We invested in the testing and in evaluating what works, in mainstreaming, 
And of course, we're also looking to the future. We will next year invest in innovative financing mechanisms. Social impact investment and payment for results are interesting things that UNDP is not yet embracing that we want to test. Does that improve our work? We work closely with other UN agencies on pushing the innovation agenda. UNICEF, for example, just launched a wearables for development challenge. Quite future oriented, but it might be super relevant in 10 years. And we provide a little bit of support for the UNICEF um, wearables challenge, which is a great piece of work by supporting the finalist groups with as coaches and mentors, some people from our team. And well, with that, I want to say thank you again and open for discussion. Thank you very much. Really very interesting. I have a list of questions here. Um, we will come to the people who are, are watching us online in a minute with questions. I see this looking through what we've received. But is there anybody in the room here who would like to start with some questions or comments? Peter uh, and then this lady. Yeah. Um, this is just a request that if you can speak as loudly as you can. Yeah, I'm maybe introduce yourself. Yeah. yeah, I'm Peter Shevan from uh, NORA, the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation. Thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation and with all these good uh, examples, it's very interesting to hear. And I think the principles you have here, uh, especially with the design for user and the scale, is very important. So I think that's a very good approach. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, or if you can uh, elaborate a bit on um, given other actors in uh, the innovation realm, um, both private and also other multilaterals. You mentioned also uh, the other UN organizations. And given UNDP's mandate, uh, especially on democratic governance, maybe, and uh, conflict prevention. How do you see um, your advantage, or how do you go about um, yeah, trying to, to fulfill that mandate with all the other actors, and how do you strategically align to that, um, given the other actors? And second question would be, um, what do you see as challenges, some of your biggest challenges uh, going forward now? Thank you. Should we take a couple of questions? Or do you want to answer them? My experience is for people online, it's sometimes difficult to follow in the discussion in a room okay. with multiple questions. So okay, maybe we can all. just take them. Yeah. yeah. With the other actors, we work closely with the innovation teams of the other agencies. In terms of our mandate, sometimes it's a combination of structural and unfortunate personal coincidences. We have an innovation lead sitting in the UN um, Coordination Office, UN DOCO, who used to be a UNDP colleague, very much engaged in our innovation work. And the team there is replicating our model of having an innovation fund and actually investing in citizen feedback mechanism, in data for development, as we do too, and in foresight. So, Things that we started pushing the envelope for now spilled over to the UN DOCO system. UNDP has the mandate to coordinate the UN system on the national level. The UNDP resident representative is always the UN resident coordinator. So we work very closely with the innovation team of UN DOCO. And the model, how we are structured internally in UNDP, was taken up by DOCO, many of the fields as well. And we have a close exchange on what we do. Last year, for example, we invested in a method that's called micro-narratives. We look at ways of getting better data. We push our colleagues not only to better specify what's the development challenge, what quantitative data do you have at hand, what ethnographic methods can you embrace at a low cost to get qualitative data, but we're also looking at the M&E side through so-called big data. But this instrument of micro-narratives is super interesting for us. It goes out, Cognitive Edge is our partner there, it's a think tank, and interviews people with a standardized um, format and collects stories. We did that in DRC. We wanted to know what's the public perception of the different actors involved in reconciliation and the peace process. 
and it then combines qualitative stories with a method to put it into quantitative measures. That's not a silver bullet, but it's a really, really good approach, we believe. We've tested in a number of countries in different settings too, so from DRC to Moldova, to see how can we improve our M&E work. What are innovations in that realm? And Doko just did a webinar for the UN um, country teams with our colleague who ran the initiative in DRC. So just to give you a concrete example of um, how we cross-fertilize, how we influence each other. And with other actors, we have a number of institutions we work very closely with and we are highly inspired by. Nesta, we frame innovation with a certain framework that starts with the development challenge and then goes into scanning the horizon, who's already working on it. And we always encourage our country officers, look at activist groups, look at unusual suspects that are either already openly working on it or might have an interest. Invite them to kind of generate ideas how we can address it together. And other partners include yeah, Cognitive Edge, Mind Lab. So those are some of the big players. And on the national level, we really work together sometimes with IT community. Um, with activist groups in some of the more autocratic countries to provide them a space um, to express their views and broaden the space for governance and participation. The Singapore Centre is an important partner for us and the Oslo Centre will become an important partner for us within UNDP. Yeah, and in terms of challenges, one challenge is to actually fulfill this principle of be data driven. To create initiatives that have very, very clear measurement factors. The ones with the tax letter is an example where it's super clear. But sometimes when we do participatory foresight in Sudan, for example, it's very difficult, of course, to measure it um, and to actually live up to this principle. Some are more than others. But we know that in order to convince internal stakeholders, of the usefulness of some of those tools, we have to have concrete data sets that prove this is more cost effective, this is more effective than others. Another challenge is when you talk about innovation, we always say, you know, our funding is the space to experiment, to test out new things. And usually in the private sector, there's this, you test 10 things, eight will fail, two will work. And please talk about what failed because there's huge potential for learning your failure. Now with UNDP, we realized the term failure is not so conducive <laughs> for donors, but also internally. Um, colleagues are very hesitant to talk about, yeah, that really failed. It didn't work. So getting a culture where we are very transparent, we are learning from what doesn't work, it's not easy. And at least one insight is don't embrace that term failure for us. That's, so it's a small challenge to get to a culture where that is done. Another one is now in the context of sustainable development goals, it's not only UNDP, it's in my perception, the majority of the development community talking about solutions, also tech-enabled solutions. Whereas we are very much problem-focused. We want to innovate what are the bottlenecks and sometimes also say it's probably necessary to reframe a development challenge. Is this what we perceive as the main challenge really the challenge for the majority of people affected? How can we first get good data to get to the nitty gritty of it? So working in an organization in a context where it's solution driven, but you want to be problem driven, is a challenge that we have, or we haven't found a solution for. But we have the problem. <laughs> Another challenge, and then I'll have a lot of challenges, is scale. We always say design for scale. We developed many mobile-based feedback mechanisms. I presented a few. But how to design something that can be scaled and is yet context-specific? I said earlier this best practice that you just put from one context to another is, in our experience, nothing that really works. You have to be context-specific when you introduce an innovation. But that, that challenge of the right approach to scale is something that we constantly discuss and test out. One example I didn't present, but that's something where I perceive a high potential for scale is we opened up a big data lab with Baidu, the largest internet provider in China last year, to see, hey, you guys sit on the data, 
and you sit on the data science expertise, we sit on the development challenges, what can we do together? The first idea we cooked up didn't work at all. Well, two months of you know back and forth trying out what didn't work. What worked quite well, we tested it in two city, was to address the problem of e-waste. All kind of e-waste dumped irregularly in China, posing huge environmental challenges. In those two cities, we had a number of medium-sized enterprises who would pick up the e-waste from the streets. We brought them together with Baidu, with our people, and thought of a model that proved really successful, which is Baidu Recycle. It's an app. Smartphone penetration is really high in those two cities, so an app was a realistic idea. If you're an end user, a household in one of those two cities, and there was massive uptake from the media promoting that app, and we had hundreds of thousands of downloads in the first four months. You download the app, you take a picture of your old computer, the app recognizes it because Baidu helped us design it and they sit on the big data analysis, and you get a notification that this is probably worth $1.70 or so, but you have somebody coming at your doorstep to pick up your old computer. You get a very small fee, but you have the service of having somebody picking it up. It's a win-win for the user, for those companies, and for development and the environment. And I think that's a business model that might be really scalable. How it's introduced, how the nitty-gritty is that's different from China to maybe New York where I live. One day they hopefully have something like that. But this is something where I think it's probably easier to scale than the nudges in Moldova might be very different to the nudges to address HIV, um, HIV AIDS in Guatemala. But the practice of the behavioral insight and then designing nudges, that's something you want to scale. Great, thank you. This lady had a question and then we'll come online. Hmm? Uh, you basically answered the five questions, <laughs> challenges. Uh, but I just want to bring them up again because we, um, I'm Cynic Seven and I work for the Science by Borders. And we basically do exactly what you were talking about. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was very nice uh, listening. Um, and we experience, of course, uh, many of the same challenges. Uh, one of them being uh, the, the fact that most organizations, when they approach us, they already have a preconceived solution to a, problem, to a problem that they want us to work on. And we quite often then end up in a situation where we uh, end up developing a solution which actually only is a band aid on a different problem, which keeps a lot from spilling too much. Which maybe could have been the issue with the Guatemala tax session, uh, where maybe the real problem is corruption, and that people don't believe that their money is actually going where it's supposed to, which is the reason why they don't pay tax. Um, and for us, it's often a problem with, with uh, being able to, to measure the impact afterwards and, and the, the, the uh, amount of effort put into a problem and the output you get. Because when you start framing the problem differently for, for the part that you're working with, it will become very unsecure. They don't really know what you will be working at and addressing and what their outcome will be, uh, also economically, uh, and are very hesitant to fork that right then. Uh, and finding solutions for that is really important, but also my experience is that it's a lot higher on the agenda now that we don't have to innovate just to innovate, but we actually have to innovate because there is a problem and we need to find the right problem. Um, and the other one was Scale versus context is human centered design, maybe too low to be able to be upscale. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, say that it's worth looking into public sector and how they are handling this. They're experiencing uh, many of the same problems. When you co design a solution, the implementation is pretty much secure because everybody has been part of the process, but it isn't transferable necessarily to the next hospital or to the next agency. And they are looking into methods of uh, developing solutions that enable uh, services to allow to take part of the uh, control of the process so that you don't always have to send designers to do it, but that it also can be done to a large degree locally. So that one question is just saying thank you for bringing up Guatemala. What is the problem? Is tax a problem? What's the problem for the citizens? And I don't have an answer, but I, but I love the critical view on it. And the other one, it's also a challenge we pose ourselves in terms of human-centered design. How context-specific is it? But I don't 
there's a problem of getting designers in the right institutions, of course, and to what degree do you decentralize that? But if that's the answer, I'm personally a big believer in, in context-specific solutions. There's an interesting discussion about co-designing public services, for example, and then testing out how accepted and effective they are through randomized control trials. To what extent can you scale them? So that's combinable, for example, those two approaches. Are we going to go online? Uh, 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 we're going to go online, and I'd just like to apologize to those who could hear the drilling on the roof, but doesn't, <laughs> not quite sure where it's coming from. It's not your internet connection. There appears to be some major building work suddenly started above us. Ashley, was there anybody online who wanted yes. to come in? Yes. Um, for this webinar, we've had about 20 people online uh, globally, and uh, we have actually two questions. One from UNDP Macedonia, who, uh, there's a colleague, Pavlina, who's asking, UNDP Macedonia is supporting City of Skopje in development of climate change strategy, Resilient Skopje. Foresight methodology will be used to identify the most vulnerable sectors for climate change. Can you give us some recommendations on how to ensure participants, participation and involvement, and maybe some relevant hints and tips to ensure feedback? There's one more if you want me to run through that or you want to answer this before going to the next one. Because I don't have off-the-shelf recommendations, to be honest, um, for getting the best participation. We just ran two participatory UNDAP exercises in Eastern Europe. UNDAP is the UN Development Assistance Framework, quite a long planning process for the UN family and the government to develop those um, instruments. And we had very good citizen participation in one of the countries and not so good in the other. You could probably brand it as a failure in terms of participation. Also the reason why I'm not going to name the countries. But there are valuable lessons from both and I'll make sure I'll put you in touch with those. Uh, what is the best way to engage citizens in Macedonia um, for that? Honestly, right now I, I would bring up very broad recommendations I'm not sure add value. But I'll put you in touch with the people who ran the participatory um, UNDAP exercises and our expert for strategic foresight to have the best recommendations possible. There's one more question from New York from Bernardo Coco. Thanks for presenting, Ben, and thanks to Sarah and colleagues for assembling a great audience. Ben, we hear much about scale, particularly about the need to prototype and scale up rapidly. Can you say a little bit more about how we at UNDP are trying to foster this? What promising stories have we seen thus far? Thanks, Bernardo. One, one approach for us to promote scaling is so we reach out to our country offices. When I talked about the fund earlier, we give funding to country offices that test out new ways of doing business, UNDP country offices. We ask them from the get-go, what is your scaling pathway? And we also provide them with a checklist where they specify what's their idea for getting this concept, if proven successful, to partners, to bring to scale. The Baidu example is a success, for example, where this is taken up by the private sector. Papua New Guinea, Maldives, and a number of other mobile feedback mechanism initiatives for citizen engagement are examples where the government took over the costs for those systems. We had other examples of citizen engagement um, via mobile phones, where we got private sector funding, but out of corporate social responsibility. And that's limited the number of years. Nobody took on those costs. That's not sustainable. So we have a keen interest in identifying partners who have a, um, an interest from the get-go to make it sustainable. We never have, from the get-go, when you start testing an initiative, the guarantee, but we always push for the scaling potential for it. And at the same time, being context-specific with a certain scaling pathway instrument. Again, we saw out of 50% of our initiatives last year funded um, an uptake, which is the necessary condition for scaling. And when we talk scaling, also the concepts that we promote abroad to scale. We tested out human-centered design in two or three country offices in 2012. And today, I would have to look at the data, but we have over 40 of those initiatives. So bringing methods within UNDP to scale is something that we do. 
and furthermore engaging the private sector in this discussion about shared value. Where's a business interest for you, Baidu, for example, and where's a interest for us as working on sustainable development, and where can we meet in the middle is something that we push further and further with different private sector companies. Today I mentioned Vodafone and Baidu, those are two of our partners, and we have many more on the national levels. And also discussion on the global level where we pursue such partnerships. Tesla is a solar company, for example, we work with quite intensively to look at um, getting off the grid communities on the grid. Thank you. Good. My name is Candice Lasuda. I'm a comic flower with Ochoa. We are working on innovation processes and solving challenges. Um, you just answered a few of the questions I was just trying to ask you about. That was the business model, very part of the private sector. But uh, do you also have any ideas or ways where you actually involve the user as an owner or a, uh, you know, to have this to live for long? Um, because the solutions or the challenges you meet, uh, it could be owned by company. But we also look at how is it possible to involve the end user who is actually going to use it. Yeah, we, we, have a, <laughs> we have a couple of examples of those. We, in a number of countries, Egypt, Georgia, Moldova, launched an initiative called um, Scan the Future and Make the Future. We wanted to see what are organizations on the national level that are already dealing with today's and tomorrow's development challenges and how can we bring them together. So, there the initiative focused very much on what are new partners and how can we foster networks of those organizations so they productively work together. UDP has also a certain convening role and that's what we did in this initiative. So for us this was really about a network creation, also in different political contexts, one being more open than others, democratically. And then UDP also not only providing a convener role but the role of getting the framework right for having conversations, what are today's development challenges and tomorrow's and, and how can we address them. One of our partners there is Edge Riders. Edge Riders is a network of activists that came out of an EU-sponsored initiative for good governance that work on the intersection of technology and social change. And out of those networks come micro-solutions, very context-specific ones, but that's owned by the users. That's activist and NGO driven initiatives and we convened. Those are the smaller scale examples. But nonetheless important, you never know what these initiatives will lead up to us in terms of political change in such countries over the long term. I was um, telling someone about the Telnet and the big data examples. And I'm actually working with our research team on big data from the Tomer side, and we have a data-driven developing project. And I'm just curious, um, because we just launched a study last week on how to predict dengue in Pakistan. We work with Harvard and other academic partners. And how does the UNDP also involve, obviously, corporate partners, but the academic partners and other parts of the UN, like the UN Global Pulse, for example? How do you work with those partners? Last year we worked with you in Global Pulse, which is a special small office which was inaugurated by the Secretary General, I believe, in 2009 to look at big data. So those huge data sets uh, generated through mobile phones and online interactions. And you in Global Pulse is the UN office that has the data science expertise, but also the right expertise in addressing privacy and security. Last year we initiated in Indonesia a data for policy making conference to discuss for countries in Asia Pacific the implication of those data sets using it by the government for development purposes while securing privacy and security. We are very much engaged in those discussions and are running this year a trial in five country offices where we brought in data science via UN Global Pulse to look at how can we use the available data sets in these countries to either better do planning or improve our M&E. This is work in progress and by the end of the year we'll publish review in Global Pulse a big data cookbook for UNDP country offices to make it rooted in UNDP practice and to tell them a little bit step by step, here's how you can approach the data providers. Here's the partners MIT, for example, you should engage for privacy and security. 
And here is how it can inform your planning. Here is how it can inform your M&E. So we're very much engaged in this debate. We have had a couple of trials to look at um, using social media data um, for for robust poverty or changes in poverty levels in Egypt. And yeah, have Baidu Big Data Lab. We have um, absolutely on. These discussions also involve the UNFPA, for example, who is the UN Fund for Population Affairs, who um, look very closely at uh, big data and have very interesting trials, and we work closely with them just on those debates, privacy, security. There's one more online, we have a minute, and then we'll come back here. There's one more question from Per Arvik from CMI. Could we hear a little bit more about the reuse of innovations? Are there examples of systems developed in one country that have been successfully exported elsewhere? Yes. <laughs> one example that's easy to just point out again was, for example, a mobile feedback mechanism for infrastructure damages. Fix my street to make my island. That's an adaptation of an innovation. And we have many of, um, of those mobile feedback-based mechanisms that have been applied from one context to another. We supported last year um, with financial contribution UNICEF in rolling out U-Report in Nigeria, which was developed in Uganda. It's an instrument to get the pulse of young people on development questions. And in some instances, the young people, when they respond, they get a little top off of the mobile phone um, credit as an incentive or another form of feedback. So U-Report, which is not a UDP initiative, it's UNICEF, but that's an innovation brought from one context to another to get the opinions of young people into development planning and policy making. Um, we did the same with micro-narratives in DRC, which was mainly for the UN planning to get the perceptions on the actors, and in Moldova and Georgia with Cognitive Edge. And other examples of um, innovations being reused will hopefully be the Baidu Recycle um, example where we are working on scaling. Another one was Youth unemployment, a highly complex development challenge, and there's no blueprint solution for it. We identified that in Haiti, often it's extremely difficult for young people in communities with um, barriers, infrastructure barriers, to get the right form of education and the right form of um, business support to launch their own businesses. So what we did was we brought to a roving innovation lab in a bus those um, business incubation to them, to communities that are hard to reach. And we designed the outreach with young people from those communities. Outreach meaning, how do we get the word out? This bus is coming for a number of months to your place. This is what you can get out of the bus. So first we had a hackathon, bringing people together, some IT people from the capital, young people from the community, to identify how can we spread the word in the most effective way. Once that was done, we got and I would have to look at the complete numbers and the exact numbers, but I believe several hundred of young people coming forward wanting this business incubation training. And from the broad group that were, went through the first round, we narrowed it down based on the business ideas to a smaller group, to a further smaller group. And in the end, it's 16 young people who received um, seed funding and also support through a crowdfunding campaign in launching their own business. And this initiative, when it was kicked off, for example, we encouraged our colleagues again to work out loud. They tweeted, somebody in the Prime Minister's office came across the tweet, and then we, we got a briefing at the Prime Minister's office um, based on Twitter communication. And he expressed large interest and said, if this is successful, if you can show a reduction in, in youth unemployment based on such a roving innovation lab, we'll scale it. This was an expression of interest and hasn't gone further yet. But this concept is something we promote for blogging, and now a number of our African colleagues and country offices said, oh, this is interesting, we want to apply that too. So reuse of an innovation methodology, for example. Those were some examples, but this cross-fertilization plays a huge role. We take concepts that we see are potentially successful and bring them to another context. You had a question. Hi, uh, my name is Niki. You can speak um, louder. Uh, my name is Niki. I'm from Unicef, Norway. Yeah, yeah um, when uh, mobile technology is used uh, as a like, civil engagement tool, like you evolved with other things, it's one thing that you are trying to collect information. 
possibility in gaming. But then, when like a, a mobile phone or mobile technology is used for uh, public service delivery or message delivery, there is a certain fear of, it. and then we involve the government. There is certain fear of this mechanism used being used publicly. Are there any um, example, concrete example? What other human agency? We are always working with government, and we are developing this technology system. Eventually, we want to hand, we want to hand it over to the government, mm -hmm. and then hopefully it is sustainable. But then we have donors, and uh, I'm sure certain donors always have certain fear of working with government. It's a good government uh, question in a way. Mm -hmm. Are there any cases of misabuse, or are there any? Uh, safeguard uh, mechanism, or are there any complete examples of your experience? We haven't had in our mobile-based feedback mechanism and engagement mechanism initiatives concrete cases of abuse by the government. Mm -hmm. In the countries that are more autocratic we work with, we make a big point in engaging citizens and activist groups first, and um, in parallel assessing government responsiveness. But we don't want to put people at harm, and we also don't want to alienate people by creating a feedback mechanism, and the government is not responding. This is would be then kind of a consultation without any reaction from the government that will alienate people. And we have, in a couple of cases, decided not to go with a certain feedback mechanism because we perceive the government responsiveness as practically non-existent. And then it would be the cost of people putting their voice forward. Um, Engaging and nothing happens, and we thought then it's not the right vehicle, it's not the right approach. In terms of these data sets, it's fortunately global policy pushes the conversation on data privacy and security. I recently was at a conference where somebody said, and this was a data specialist, I think development might repeat mistakes we did in sustainable development by putting large investments in industries that then had a negative impact on the environment for economic growth. Now we're putting a lot into data for development without addressing privacy and security adequately and that might one day fall on our feet on the feet of citizen and autocratic regimes. And I share that concern and again when we work in auto more autocratic regimes, um, we make a big point in only pursuing those pathways when we think the right expertise is on board for privacy and security. But that's very context specific and it's politically sensitive to talk about and I'll point out several countries where we work and where those were the cases. That's a good lead into my one of my questions and then I'll come back to the others who have questions. Um, my question was more about the politics. Um, and uh, you're often identifying solutions that are process-driven, technology-driven, uh, system-driven. As we know, especially those of us who work in governance know, very often it's about politics. The problem doesn't get solved because there's no political incentive to do so. So in many countries, I don't know about the Maldives, the potholes won't get mended because actually there's no re incentive yeah. for people to mend it. How do you, one, deal with, assess the, the political challenges to solving the problems, and two, deal with them? How do you integrate that into the innovation model? First of all, we promote being not only problem centric but also doing your political analysis right. In UNDP, we embrace the institutional development analysis tool some years ago, which was high time. I think it was the inspiration from the World Bank that had a political economy analysis tool that UNDP adapted. When we talk about innovation, we, we underline this. Be problem driven and acknowledge complexity, embrace complexity. And politics is a big part of it. So when I said in some instances we perceive the government responsiveness as non-existent, that might be because of lack of political will, might be lack of the incentives. Fortunately, we have the governance expertise in UNDP. We work within country offices where people have great expertise in governance. Just those innovation methods is something we promote including as well. But it's then the colleagues who have these experience in governance and other parts who usually bring those insights. And we, we pointed out a lot in the work that we do in publications that we write but on the ground to do this political analysis of the different actors. 
So that's a very broad answer, but that's kind of all we can do, and also using that tool that's within UNP's toolbox. Not coming out of the innovation shop, um, that's a different initiative, but something we, we support very much to be keen on understanding political dimensions and not thinking development is something that has nothing to do with politics, which has, of course. Right, thank you. I'm glad to hear that the institutional context analysis is being used within UNP. That was a tool that was was developed here actually in Oslo oh, a few okay. years a few years back. So it's so always good to hear that it that it's actually having practical uses in other parts of the organization. Um Sina, you had another question, mm -hmm. comment. I was curious about um, a platform for sharing methods and ways of working. Uh, because uh, innovation is at least in the humanitarian sector a very big buzzword these days. Also partly in the long term development sector. Uh, and it is very often uh, a bit linked borderline to design, and especially human centered design and co development and, and private sector collaborations and, and so on. Um, but I feel in terms of using design practices and disciplines, it's quite new, it's quite exploratory still, as is design for the public sector. Uh, and I really, um, does UNDP have any plans to establish uh, any plan? for sharing and disseminating methods, what is worked and what has not worked, how can data mapping be used, how can you share with other with us uh, ways of doing foresight planning, which is a new thing for us, which would be very interesting. Because I think there is so much to learn from each other. There are so many different innovation labs popping up. And they're all working, they all want to communicate the results of what they've been doing, but method-wise and how they work, it's it's quite close maybe and also exposure. Yeah. There is no such platform yet, and we will not develop one. We'd rather use one that's in the making under the leadership of USAID with the support of, I believe, Diffit and Rockefeller, but that's something I have to look up. We have been talking to all of these outfits. Um, they have, for example, USAID, Diffit, Australian Aid, they launched a global innovation fund yeah. last year. And some of these involved actors are launching a global innovation exchange the kind of platform you just mentioned. And we decided it's better for us to leverage a platform developed by very different actors and join them instead of UNDP trying to develop another global platform. And this is work in progress, and I, I'm a big believer in working together on such platforms. The OECD already has one, but that's limited to OECD countries. That's quite an interesting marketplace for innovations. And those are the two initiatives I'm aware of at this point. Are there any further questions, comments? I have another one, if I can take the privilege of the chair. Um, it's partly a reflection. When does something stop becoming innovation and a way of doing business? And in that context, can innovation actually be a, calling something innovation be a disadvantage? So some of the things that you mentioned, I have worked with versions of for maybe 20 years. Um, and yet, innovation also has a bit of a, a downside in that people see it as something that's a fad, that's trendy, I don't want anything to do with that. And yet, some of these things are just actually good practice ways of working that shouldn't be cocooned in an innovation department, but all of us who are development professionals should be using regularly. So um, I realize there's a few issues bundled up, up in that, but how do, how do you respond to questions and comments like that? Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it is a buzzword, and it might be a fad. I think the reason why all my colleagues and I are into it, because we're all driven to do a better job, actually. We're all not happy with when we solve problems and projects. Good work, not good enough. And for us, sometimes, very true. Framing this innovation might be counterproductive. Everybody wants to be innovative. Some people have the fear, oh, I need to be very creative to be innovative. It's not about new things necessarily, not about creativity necessarily. For us right now, this focus on innovation is a good opportunity to drive certain methods we believe have merit and can add value. And I think what the added value of the innovation discourse is, is to stay on top of things, to look what's in the future. I mentioned social impact investment payment by result of an organization that hasn't done it yet. UNICEF launched a wearables for good challenge, I think about a month and a half ago. 
wearables as in you might know those bracelets that measure how fast and long you jog. What are the potentials of such sensors for development, for child mortality, for maternal health? Super interesting. We informally support UNICEF by being a mentor to some of the finalists. Now there are 10 finalists identified. That's very forward looking. And UNICEF can only afford it, I think, because they have an innovation team looking that far in the future. And having innovation teams that scan the horizon, what's coming up? We are working with OCHA, with UNICEF, on the um, right policies of drones. UDP does not use drones at the moment, but some other actors do. But UDP will work with governments in supporting them in writing the right policy for the use of drones, with the right exceptions when a humanitarian crisis happens. So and I think the merit of having, I'm talking to somebody who works in the innovation team, obviously I'm biased, but the merit of having an innovation team is to stay on top of those trends and bring them into your organization, bring them to discourse, make them practically happen, test them. But eventually, Many of those things I mentioned today are things we're working on mainstreaming. Not further necessarily investing it, but now mainstreaming and UDP looking at what's on the future, what's out there, what makes sense. Did I answer your question? Yes, I think so. Okay. <laughs> uh, before I wrap it up, finally, is there any other questions in the room or online? Okay. Yes, go ahead. I'm from China and I'm a master's student at Otto University, and then my major is about environment and sustainability. So I'm looking at, uh, my, now I'm doing my master's thesis to looking at the environment project in China. And uh, I, yeah, I know, China, like, for everybody you know, China is a uh, quite unique, uh, critical and a cultural system. And for UNDP, like, you have a lot of projects in China, as so what you mentioned about uh, with the Baidu. And, uh, I, I'm quite curious about what's the like, most uh, challenges for, like, international students I have not worked in China, I have to admit I worked in okay. Nepal and India when it comes to Asia, but not in China. So I don't feel in a position to really answer what are the most challenges. I'm sorry, I don't have that knowledge yeah. to, to answer, but I'm sure I can put you in touch with colleagues in UDP China who can answer that very, very well. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Thank you for all, all for coming, but especially thank you to Ben, which for a really, really interesting uh, discussion and presentation. And thanks to all those who joined us online as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.